listening to Give God 90, where we're not afraid of the tough biblical questions, because we will dig through the language, the culture, and the history to find the truth revealed in the words of our Creator. My name is Jerry Mitchell. As usual, the, the only person that can keep me straight is sitting next to me. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Iris Smith with us this evening. Um, it is Thursday night. We are live here, wherever you may be. It might be some other time, right? Right. Because we have people from all over the world listening to us and wouldn't have it any other way. Uh, we really enjoy all the folks that uh, listen all over the place, uh, we have folks from, well, I haven't had anybody from Antarctica. Ah. But the other six continents have checked in. Yeah. So, we're, we're good to go there. Um, just, <laughs> that's just one of those weird things that you think about every once in a while. You know, here, uh, growing up where I grew up, in the Mid-Atlantic region, it was a tourist town by the time uh, every, everything was uh, my generation. Prior to that, it was uh, either an agricultural area or a fishing uh, area. There was a lot of Menhaden uh, fishing done here. And you never think that you're going to reach out to the rest of the world from an area like this. Uh, didn't stay here the whole time we spent quite a few years in Colorado, uh, moved back. But, you know, now we're reaching out and people are finding us. Had a uh, person find me today on social media and wanted to share some things. And it was it was interesting. Um, she takes psalms out of the King James Bible and puts them to music. I thought that was kind of cool. It's not exactly my genre of music, but I like the content. Let's put it that way. Uh, don't forget, <clears throat> the uh, books are still available, uh, as always. Tradition to Truth, God's Universe, God's Rules, wherever good books are sold. Find a local bookstore and help them out, if you would. Um, don't forget to go to GiveGodDonnie.com. There's all kinds of good stuff there. The video page is there. Hopefully a new one will be coming out in a few weeks. I'm not, I was going to try and get it out before Passover. I'm not sure that's going to happen, but we'll try. We'll see what happens between now and then. Uh, all kinds of good stuff going on. You know, spring's coming, change season's changing, getting warmer in the northern hemisphere. It's probably cooling off some in the southern hemisphere. And from what I saw on the weather uh, in Australia the other day, they're probably looking for some cooler weather. Mm -hmm. It was hot down there. Yes, it was. So, you know, all that's going on. Um, I'm kind of putting off what I want to talk about tonight, aren't I? <laughs> I'm doing a good job of it. I'm too. doing a good job of it. <laughs> there is, let's see where I'm going with this. Some people would consider what I'm going to say tonight heresy. Okay, I'm just going to put it out there. Uh, and here's the warning for my Jewish listeners, and there are quite a few of you. Don't think you're the only one out there. Uh, I'm going to be looking at a New Testament passage tonight, and believe it or not, this is one of those few times when my Jewish listeners are probably going to appreciate this more than my Christian listeners. Right. Right? Because <laughs> they know where what the question I'm asking comes from. Okay? They know what this means. Now, my, my Christian listeners, they're going to um, be challenged to rethink about how they understand a particular verse that they're very familiar with. And what I'm looking at is that we use certain types of speech in English that gets confusing. And when you translate it from one language to English or from a different language, whether it's Hebrew or Greek or whatever it may be, into English, uh, it just creates confusion because sometimes, because of the syntax in, in the languages, it gets confused. We don't really recognize what we're talking about. Hey, there's Carol joined us tonight. Glad to see you. Hi, Carol. 
Oh, by the way, you know, I saw Jay's uh, uh, message earlier on uh, a post, or not a post, but on a message. And um, he can listen to us on Thursday nights with uh, Tina's phone. You know, just saying. <laughs> he, he doesn't... I don't, he doesn't I, have, the, have to have the new computer hooked up. Not yet. He doesn't have to have it. But I think he likes it because I think he likes to comment. And he can type easier on his computer than he can on that phone. Right. Yep. So, glad to see you with us, Carol. Appreciate it. But there's a lot of things in the language uh, translations that, that make things confused. Now, we add that to the use of pronouns like him or her or she or he, and we sometimes wonder who the he or she or him or her is that we're talking about. And I didn't really think about that until a number of years ago, um, I was listening to a rabbi and he was talking about when Joseph was in jail in Egypt and, you know, the, the two people that he were there were the cupbearer and, and uh, the baker, they had dreams. Well, the way it's written in English, <laughs> I see that, Carol. The way it's written in English, it really doesn't come across that the baker's dream was interpreted by the cupbearer and the cupbearer's dream was interpreted by the baker. But it makes perfect sense in Hebrew when you read it that way. And it does. So is it any wonder that when we talk about things in English and we use him or her, it's like I often use the analogy, she washed her car. Well, whose car got washed? Right? Hers, right? Well, who's the her? Did the she wash her own car? Or did the she wash maybe her sister's car? You don't know without the other context of everything coming into that sentence, right? Right. So, with that in mind, <clears throat> we're going to look at a, a very familiar verse. And everybody's going to know when I say this, they're going to cringe. I can, I can hear it now. They're going to cringe. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Right? Right. Okay. Well... That's probably the most recognizable Bible verse in the Christian world. I, I think it is, anyway. But, who's the him in that verse? Let me read this a little slower this time. I blew through it. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Who's the him? Most Christians are going to jump the gun and say, well, of course it's Jesus, right? Right. That's what they've been taught all their life. Mm -hmm. That's what tradition tells us. That's what tradition, tradition tells, tells us. us. What does the Bible say? Is the Bible more accurate than tradition? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Is the Bible more reliable than tradition? Absolutely. Absolutely. So let's look at this. Who is the him? Actually, let's back up a second. Let's maybe take a step back and look at this verse a little more deeply. Before we get to the word him, what does the word word world mean in this verse? Is it the whole sin-filled, evil world that is being referred to? You know, we look at these words and we look at, you know, if you only read the English or if you only believe what you've been taught and you never dig into this stuff, you don't grasp the concepts. Now, some people may go as far as to look up what this word world is in the Strong's Concordance. Now, if you look it up in Strong's, you're going to find that's number 2889. And the definition in the Strong's Concordance is the world, the universe, worldly affairs, the inhabitants of the world, and adornment, 
But if you keep studying, if you dig a little deeper, if you go into a Greek lexicon, you're going to find other word uses for this word. In Greek, it's kosmos, which is where we get the English word cosmos, which typically, when we think of the cosmos, we think of everything out in the universe, right? The stars and the, and the planets, planets and, and all that space stuff. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's the space stuff. Space stuff. Uh, space stuff. Just, okay. It's how I think of it anyway. Space stuff. But when you, when you actually dig into this word, it can also mean an orderly system. Our cosmos is an orderly system. It's just not some bunch of stuff thrown out there, right? It's actually, uh, it has meaning, it has order, but it can also mean an orderly ensemble and even an orderly people. Hmm. Any idea who the orderly people is that it might be referring to? And I say might be because I'm not 100% drawn to that yet I'm working on it there's some other things I got to work out but I needed to, to go here because when people hear this they're going to start thinking well and and a lot of people that I reach are the are the thinkers they're going to be out there going hmm I've heard this phrase before and you, well, you've heard it is in Isaiah 38 1 and it reads in those days Hezekiah Oh, I'm sorry. In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death. He was a hurt puppy. Okay, he was he was dying. Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, came to him and said, Thus saith the Lord, Set your house in order, for you will die and you will not live. Now Hezekiah was a king. I don't think the house we're talking about here is just the castle. When a king is told to get his house in order, it means his kingdom, the people in the kingdom. Get your house in order because, Hezekiah, you're going to die. An orderly people, cosmos, an orderly people. Peter's second letter gives us a clue about how the Almighty separates uh let's just say the world, okay, for lack of a better term. Good and evil, good and bad, that kind of thing. He's explaining the perfect fairness of the Creator's judgment. And in Second Peter 2, 5 and 6, And spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. Now, there's a lot of things going on in here, and I'm not going to take time to dig through all of these, but uh, verse 6. Turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly. Now, there's other places... Um, that also mentioned how the wicked world would be destroyed, but the orderly world, those who, even though they might not be perfect, but they were trying, uh, striving for righteousness, they would be saved. We could actually say that in the previous examples, God hates the wickedness of the world and will destroy it. No matter if that whole world, if it is a whole world, no matter if it's a city or two or a few, like the cities of the plains, we have the examples of the flood. We have the examples of Sodom and Gomorrah and those other cities on the plain. We have the example of the firstborn of the, the sons of Egypt. We have those examples. We know what the Almighty is willing to do to destroy evil in the world. So now that we know that this word world may not be pertaining to what we thought it was, right? right? If God loved the world, like the dirt and the trees and, I don't know, the plants, 
right? Why would he have gone to such trouble to save only the animals and a few people and, you know, so enough vegetation to get them restarted again? It's not the dirt and the air and the stuff. It's the people that he's concerned about. It's the souls he's concerned about. So now we can figure out, maybe, who the him is in this verse. We need to believe in him if we're to have eternal life. What name goes there? Really, Christians, if you're still listening, what name goes there? John records this conversation between Yeshua and Nicodemus. Now, we know Yeshua was chastising Nicodemus in this verse because Nicodemus doesn't understand Genesis. He comes to him in John 3, 1 and asks a few questions. And he can't quite grasp the concept of Genesis. And Yeshua, Jesus, begins to explain to him. And he finally says, wait a minute, Nicodemus, you're a teacher in Israel and you don't know these things. Nicodemus was a Pharisee, right? So he should know what he's talking about, but he, he can't quite grasp it. And John 3.16 is a continuation of that chastisement. He's supposed to know Torah. He's supposed to know the prophetic writings. Would he recognize uh, someone who is assuming authority they don't have? Think about that. You know, it's it's amazing if Yeshua was referring to himself here, if Jesus was referring to himself in this verse, why not simply say me? You know, whoever believes in me shall not perish. He doesn't say that. He said whoever believes in him. This is a man standing there who has uh, spoken in other places about himself and said me. I, I am the way. Right? I am the way, the truth, and life. I, I'm the, I am this. I am that. And after this, we have him saying things, you know, where he stands up on the last great day and he says, "If anybody uh, wants to have living water, let them come. Let them come to me." But he doesn't do that in this verse, and there's a really good reason he doesn't. Actually, there's several good reasons that he doesn't. Nicodemus would know the song of Miriam, right? You remember in Exodus 15, the Egyptians are drowned, right? So they Miriam starts the song. She starts them singing. And she's like got this victory dance and song going on, right? And in Exodus 15 too, the Lord's my strength and my song. He has become my salvation, now, it's no no question there who she's talking about, right? Right. The only one they knew. The only one they knew. The one that brought them out. The one that parted the sea. Amazing how this works out, isn't it? Nicodemus would have known that song. You know, Nicodemus, he would have known the words in Isaiah 12, too. He probably had this one memorized. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. And he continues. Now, if you look at this in Hebrew, it says hine. And when you see that word, it's a big red flag to pay attention. This is something special. It's like, wow, watch this. But the next word, it's not God. It's not Elohim. It's Yah, the shortened form of Yah. Behold, Yah is my salvation, I will trust, I will not be afraid. For Adonai, Yehovah, is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. It's right there in Isaiah as well as it is in Exodus. Now we have two. How about another one? Nicodemus should have known the words of David in Psalm 27, 1. The Lord. And here, it's actually the Tetragrammaton, yod heh pav that four letters that make up the name of God. 
Yahweh is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Whom shall I be afraid? And again, Lord there is that four-letter name of God. Now, if my Christian listeners are still listening, which they probably have been mad now and turned me off, but that's okay. You know, that's why there's an off button, right? That's why there's a delete button. That's okay. Let them be lost. <laughs> Some of you that are still here might be thinking about Peter on the day of Pentecost, right? But Peter stood up on the day of Pentecost and he, and he convinces all of these people. He convinces. 5,000 people are baptized that day, right? What about those words? Well, listen to Acts 2, 14 through 21, as Myra reads from the International Children's Bible. God says, In the last days I will give my spirit freely to all kinds of people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. At that time, I will give my spirit, even to my servants, both men and women, and they will prophesy. I will show miracles in the sky and on the earth, blood, fire, and thick smoke. The sun will become dark, the moon will become red as blood, and then the great and glorious day of the Lord will come. Then anyone who asks the Lord for help will be saved. Okay. <clears throat> anyone who... Now, typically, it's translated as anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, right? Mm -hmm. He's quoting from Joel. He's quoting from the prophet Joel, verse, or chapter 2, verses 28 through 32. It says it in most Bible translations where that comes from. Now, like I said, that was the International Children's Version. What it actually... Uh, says in, I think I got this from King James, it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as Jehovah has said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. Now it's interesting here. Let me, um, let me read this to you in Hebrew so you get a feel of what's going on. Because it begins... Vahaya. Now, when you hear that, the Haya is actually part of the name of God. Vahaya. It will happen. It will be. You know that the, those four letters break down to um, I was, I am, and I will be. Here it is. I will be. Vahaya kol asher yikra basem Yehovah. Yemalet. There it is. I will be. It will be. I should say. It will be. Anyone who calls on the name of Jehovah will be saved. It's right there in Joel. Now the word saved here, uh, don't think you realize, as Joel's saying, is not what a lot of people think it is. This particular word means more of an escape type thing. Uh, it's, it's more of a physical escape than it is a spiritual escape. He's actually speaking about a physical uh, deliverance. So don't, don't let that confuse you when you start studying this, and I hope you do go dig these things out. What about Paul? Oh, here we go. I love Paul. You know, Paul's so easy to understand once you realize all he's doing is quoting Torah and the prophets. It just makes life so much easier once you get that through my thick head. It was easy. Romans 10, 13, Whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Doesn't that sound familiar? Yes. It comes right out of Joel, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Paul, you know, he continues. He's absolutely con consistent with what Moses writes, with what Isaiah writes, with what David writes, and with what Joel writes. 
In fact, Paul wants to make certain that the Romans understand what he's saying here. You know, why don't we? Why don't you read this whole passage from uh, Romans was it ten nine through thirteen? If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth in him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amazing, isn't it? Now, a lot of people want to interpret what he's saying here. And they interpret it wrongly. They, they, a lot of Christians claim, you know, what they're saying is, if you confess Jesus, you will be saved. That's not what Paul's writing. Paul never writes, if you simply believe in Jesus, you'll be saved. What he's saying here is, if you confess, if you speak, if you tell others that Jehovah raised Yeshua from the dead, and that's not a stretch because everybody in, you know, he's speaking to uh, Jewish citizens of Rome, Everybody there knew what Elijah had done, right? He had raised that uh, the Shumanite's son from the dead. It was nothing new. But he says, look, if you will tell everybody else that Jehovah raised Yeshua from the dead, you will be saved because, as David writes, confession brings salvation for everyone and the way that happens is, whosoever shall call on the name, yod heh vav -Hey, not J-E-S-U-S, -S, will be saved. They will escape with the Creator when He destroys this heaven that we know and this earth that we know. The way we need to start thinking about John 3.16, and you can use whatever translation you want, but when you think about it, think about it this way. Because Jehovah loves those who choose to love him, he is giving them a unique, one-of-a-kind example to show them the way to live. And whoever believes in Jehovah will not be destroyed, but have life on the new earth forever. That is absolutely consistent with Moses, with Isaiah, with Joel, well, everything prior to Matthew. <laughs> let's, let's just put it that way. That's absolutely consistent with everything prior to Matthew. And actually, it's consistent with everything post, or Matthew and post-Matthew. It is even consistent with Revelation, folks. Remember the end of Revelation? You get the new heaven and the new earth. The new Jerusalem doesn't stay in heaven. It is lowered to the new earth. And that's where you get to live. Now, if all of this is freaking you out and you think I'm a heretic, I suggest you spend a lot more time in the Bible. Because if you all you're depending on is your traditions to get you where you think you want to go, it's not going to work. If all you're depending on is a few, uh, a few Sunday mornings spent walking past a television with some evangelist screaming at you through a TV speaker, don't count on that for your salvation. I don't care what their name is. There's only one name in Scripture that says over and over and over again, you will be saved, and that is Jehovah. And he does that by proclaiming that he has sent one perfect example not only to teach us how to live, but if we tell others that he raised him from the dead, that right there is... What did I just read? <laughs> it's, what I, it's what I just read. Paul 
tells it. He explains it to the Romans in chapter 10. Go read it. He never says, if you believe in Jesus, you'll be saved. He says, if you tell others that the Father raised Yeshua from the dead, then you will be saved. And he continues that because David writes that confession brings salvation. You know, a lot of people like to talk about 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. But Isaiah and David both say that salvation, or I'm sorry, confession brings salvation. Uh, I can't remember exactly which psalm it is where David says, I confess my iniquity and you cleansed me. You washed me. And it's not just for you know, one particular group of people. It's available to everybody. It's available to everybody who says, you know, I choose to make the creator of the universe, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, my God. That's what it's there for. It's not there, you know, to make you feel good. It's not there to... um <laughs> give you a, a, a cheap des, uh, vacation destination after you die. It's there to help teach you how to live in this life and the next. It's multitasking. You know, it's, it's multidimensional. It's however you want to describe it, it's there. All you have to do is choose. And all I'm saying is give up your traditions... Pick up your Bible and read. I've given you, what, six or seven or eight different uh, verses in here that you can go to, and don't stop with them. You know, keep reading. It's not rocket science. All we have to do is stop trying to force our traditions into Scripture. Scripture. So what name are you going to fill the blank in with now? How are you going to replace the word him in John 3.16? Are you going to replace it with what makes sense? With what the Bible says goes there? That four Hebrew letters, yod heh vav -Hey? However you want to pronounce it, doesn't matter to me. That's not my... That's not my argument. That's for somebody else to figure out. Uh, Psalm 44 says, Even if you forgot my name, if you're searching for me, I will figure this out. Don't forget. If you're, you, but you've got to be searching. You've got to be hunting. You've got to be trying. You've got to be striving. If you now read John 3.16 and you replace the Him with the Father instead of the Son, it will turn things around for you. It will make you look at things different. It will cause you to rethink not your faith, but how you apply your faith to your life. And that's what we're after. Making sure that you apply your faith to your life properly. Living the way you're designed to live. It's not difficult. It is achievable. No matter what anybody tells you, you can do it. Not hard. Did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Everybody um, be blessed. Everybody be blessed. Absolutely. We certainly do appreciate each and every one of you. I, you know, I know this was tough. You're probably calling me a heretic, and that's okay. I can live with that. Especially when I have that many Bible verses backing me up. Until next time, everyone. Have a blessed, blessed week.